the, the big climate drivers are the sun and the oceans, <laughs> you know, the atmospheric compositions, a little bit of a minor side show, in my opinion. So Excellent. climate science is, is a very young field and it's being polluted by all this nonsense. So there's a whole lot of stuff that we don't understand. And I just wish we could, you know, get back to regular scientific business and try to figure this out rather than, you know, the scientists becoming activists and working to cancel people who disagree with them. You know, it's, it's just a horrible situation. There's there's so many fascinating things that we don't understand, you know, that are just ripe for, you know, fascinating scientific research. And, and you know, we're not doing it because we're working inside this little narrow CO2 box. Hi, everybody. This is Mind the Shift, and I'm Anders. Today, we're going to talk about the climate. Uh, it may get a little bit geeky at times, but bear with us. I'm sure that uh, we will all learn a couple of unexpected and interesting things along the way. So I am um, thrilled and honored to introduce you to Professor Judith Curry. Welcome to the show, Judith. Um, hello, Anders. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's my pleasure. So just to start off, how would you say that the discussion climate is in the climate field these days? Well, <clears throat> you know, in the old, the good old days, <laughs> when I was, um, you know, a, a young scientist, um, those of us with solid training in physics and chemistry would get together at meetings and, and, and discuss the processes and the physics and climate dynamics and the microphysics of clouds and all these sciencey topics. And, you know, that was exciting. You know, we, we understood what we didn't know and we were very excited about all the knowledge frontiers. Now, some decades later, the so-called field of climate science is hugely broad. It includes ecologists and economists and social scientists and, and, and all these people who don't really understand climate dynamics, if you will. And they're busy reciting alarming talking points rather than showing any understanding of what's really going on and certainly not being able to critique, you know, the um, alarming findings or even the consensus reports from the IPCC. So, you know, the whole field has become highly politicized and, you know, everybody, you know, even if you're in the medical field and the health field and you want to get funding, at least in the U.S., they say the best ticket is to tie your grant proposal to something related to climate change, like climate change is going to make this or that health problem even worse. So it, it's resulted in, you know, the, the silliness that is pushing us in the direction of not only messing with the science, but putting us in a place where we're making some really bad policy choices. Mm. So everybody and their aunt is a, is a climate ex expert today, including yeah. the Pope and, and Swedish teenagers, right? Yeah, well, this all started when um, Al Gore, after his movie Inconvenient Truth, he started training an army of people where they would come to a two-day workshop and learn how to give his PowerPoint presentation and thus become climate experts. <laughs> so, you know, everybody, you know, thinks that they're a climate expert. You know, I've had people, you know, in conversation, oh God, you know, you're a climate denier, you know, you're horrible. <laughs> and then I sit there and talk to them and ask them questions and, and this, that, and the other. And they start to realize that they know next to nothing about this other than, you know, a bunch of propaganda. So um, 
you know, people think they it, it's become, you know, quasi-religious in terms of people's adherence to the dogma, you know, without questioning anything. And whatever that is, it sure as heck isn't science. Mm. Do you think do you think the climate climate field is particular in this respect, or is this does this uh, go for for many other scientific oh my goodness. fields as well? At many scientific fields. Well, the health yeah. field for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Anything related to gender, <laughs> anything related to yeah, right. intelligence, um, GMOs are you know a hot topic. Um, there are many topics that have become highly politicized. Scientific topics where you know it's very hard um, to have any kind of a public presence in those fields if you don't hew to the party line or to the dogma that is somehow being enforced by so-called important people in the field, which you don't know, have a good sense of which the political which way the political winds and the funding and all that, you know, is um blowing. Yeah. So it's it's just a, a big mess. Hmm. And but you know the, the the concern is that we're making some really really bad policy choices about our energy infrastructure about our agriculture um about developing you know helping developing countries and on and on it goes you know all to support this fiction that we can control the climate with a co2 control knob mm. you know we can't um, so, you know, we're, we're in a, we're not in a good place. I'm hopeful that we've sort of reached the peak craziness and we're starting to turn the corner. Oh, that's a but, good term. Peak craziness. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm um, that. Yeah. In hindsight, you know, we won't really understand that until, you know, hindsight, but, um, I'm yeah, well, that's the problem with the climate thing. It's the lead times are so enormously long. I mean, Compared yeah. with, for instance, the COVID pandemic, which lasted three years or something, you could, I mean, people still tend to remember what what people said at the beginning and what they say now and things like that. So you can you can assess in a different way. But but here, when it comes to the climate, we're talking about fifty years. And, I mean, right. It's very difficult it, to, for, for for ordinary people to just remember what what was said twenty years ago or thirty years ago. They, they don't even remember what the weather was like thirty years ago. So it's it's very. It's actually perfect for someone who wants to <laughs> trick the 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 public that that it's going in a certain way. Yeah, it, it's a perfect vehicle for this particular social agenda that is looking for non-governmental uh, world control, UN style, you know, anti-capitalist degrowth, and on and on it goes. This is the perfect vehicle for all that. Um, just because it's so complex and so diffuse, you can characterize it however you want. Mm. Now, you've had a fascinating professional journey yourself. You became a known scientist in this field some, I think, 18 years ago or so with a research paper that said, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but it said something like that hurricanes are becoming strong or seem to be, be becoming stronger and that made you a science rock star in the standard mainstream alarmist camp. And then you said, after a while, wait a minute, we were wrong. There is no evidence that hurricanes have become stronger. And that made you a persona non grata in the mainstream alarmist camp. Tell us about that. Okay, it's a little bit more complex than that. Well, you know, I got my PhD in 1982. So I was an active scientist for decades and had, you know, received, you know, some professional recognition within the scientific community. But my inadvertent foray into the public debate was associated with this paper on hurricanes. And what we found was that looking, we were the first time that anybody looked at global hurricanes all together you know people were writing papers about atlantic hurricanes or pacific hurricanes or whatever we looked at the whole global data set in the satellite era since 1970 and we found something rather surprising that the percent of category four and five hurricanes had almost doubled since 1970. Um, in our paper we didn't attribute this to you know, fossil fuel emissions, but we did note the coincidence with the um, increasing temperatures. 
Well, this was published two weeks after Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans, you know, so, you know, this, we received just an explosive media attention and everybody was coming after us, you know, not just climate skeptics, but a lot of people from the hurricane community, you know, didn't like this. And so in 2006, I wrote a paper you know, mixing scientists and politics and testing the hypothesis that hurricanes are getting stronger. And I went through all the critiques that people had leveled, you know, including the nonsensical ones that we threw out. But there were two that sort of stuck. Um, the first one was that the data prior to about 1985 in large parts of the world's ocean, you know, just weren't any good, you know, so you know, that, that took away a lot of our thunder because a big part of the increase was associated, you know, in the early part. And the other thing is um, people were criticizing, you know, saying, well, it's just natural variability. And I recognize the importance of natural variability, but I thought all of this would cancel out in the different ocean basins. Um, you know, especially El Nino effects. They go one way in the Atlantic and the other way in the Pacific. And I thought all of this would cancel out. Well, it doesn't exactly cancel out. And so this started me on a journey to really understand the climate dynamics of regional and global hurricanes, which is, you know, continued to be a research topic of mine to this day. Um, so, you know, we acknowledge that, okay, well, and, and the latest IPCC report says, yeah, that they do see a signal of the percent of Category 4 and 5 hurricanes increasing in some ocean basins in the Atlantic and the North Indian Ocean, but whether that's natural variability or warming, you know, the jury's still out. And the IPCC predicted that there would be a 13% increase in the percent of Category 4 and 5 hurricanes by 2100. So the issue is still in play, um, <clears throat> but the magnitude is nothing, you know, like what we saw in our original paper. But, you know, we acknowledge this. Okay. And so, and, and the community, the hurricane community, you know, hurricane and climate community got together in summer of 2006 and we issued a joint press release and say, you know, look, we disagree. Things have gotten heated in the media. This is very much a work in progress. But the main message that we all agree on is that people need to protect from major landfalling hurricanes that could reach category four and five. And this has implications for the rebuilding of New Orleans. And we need to consider, you know, better land use policies and better building codes to reduce our vulnerability. So we all agreed on that message. Which, which, has, which has always been true, right? Yeah, which has always been true. But the point is the hurricane and climate wars were over in less than a year. And this is very different from the hockey stick and climate wars, which still rage on 20 years later, um, you know, where Michael Mann cannot admit his mistakes and move on. He just continues to attack people who criticize him, you know. So, um, you know, a lot of this is a fault of scientists, not all of it. A lot of it is a fault of politicians who wanted you know, we're looking to scientize their politics and find a simple answer to support their preferred policies. And of course, the media is online with, you know, any alarming clickbait, you know, that helps, you know, helps their revenue and their notoriety. So there's this whole little ecosystem that's developed, <laughs> you know, that mutually reinforces around climate alarmism with the, uh, <laughs> the public being victimized here by mm. some bad policy decisions. Mm. But you did, after you made this, I don't know if you should call it an about turn, but but you and your colleagues, you you admitted that maybe the data wasn't that clear on, on, on that hurricane thing. Then uh, um, gradually you you began writing pieces and and talking about this in a more balanced way not alarmist at all and that made you i mean 
I, as far as I understand, you grad you were gradually a bit ostracized in the community. No, the you were working at, at Georgia Tech, right? So and and eventually you felt that you you just couldn't stay there any longer. But you stayed there for many many years after this this paper, of course. Now the ostracism. I wasn't ostracized after the hurricane and climate stuff. That, that came was later, okay. perhaps. Okay, the ostracism. Okay, occurred starting November 2009 with mm. the release of the Climate Gate emails. If your listeners aren't familiar with that, <clears throat> a hacker broke into the emails of um, people at the University of East Anglia who were IPCC authors and were communicating with other IPCC authors. And there was a lot of skullduggery revealed about the hockey stick. Um, about people trying to avoid Freedom of Information Act requests, about people trying to get journal editors fired, about trying to destroy the careers of people who disagreed with them, um, trying to circumvent the rules of the IPCC for papers that are admissible, and on and on it goes. And I was absolutely appalled when I read this. And... <clears throat> I wrote an essay on the integrity of climate science, which I published on one of the major skeptics blogs, trying to say, look, okay, this is not good. We need to <clears throat> do better. We need to make all of our data and our methods publicly available and transparent. We need to be not be overconfident and be honest about uncertainties. And we need to respectfully engage with people who disagree with. Okay, so I thought all these statements were motherhood and apple pie, but they were met with silence. People were shocked. Nobody else was speaking out about this. Everyone was saying, oh, but the science is okay, and defending and try to explain this, that, and the other. They were very defensive. Okay, and, and the leaders, nobody spoke out about this until February, you know, like three months, four months later, when the president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences said, you know, look, this is really not a good look. We need to do better, calling for the, basically the same things I was calling for. And, you know, but nobody else was talking about, but that started the ostracism. Um, <clears throat> I've subsequently seen some emails where, okay, Michael Mann was clearly very upset. I mean, he was trying to, um, raised some nepotisms and accusing me of sleeping my way to the top and oh, on yeah. and on. Again. Mm. Okay. And, and those Classic things, methods. yeah. And those things didn't work. You know, nobody's going to accuse me of that or believe it or even care if it was true. Um, but then he started with the denier. Well, I know how we deal with this. We just call her a denier and throw her into that you know, other camp of crazy people. And that took off. Ah, now we know how to deal with the Judith Curry problem. Just call her a denier. Okay, so so that's when, say, 2010 is when my ostracism really began. And a lot of it was because I was female. Um, there was an article in the Scientific American that featured me and my journey through all this climate gate stuff. And Apparently, the important people, the grand poobahs, you know, of the climate science and the IPCC were incensed. And they went after the author of the article, who was Michael Lamonic. And then he wrote a follow-on article entitled, Why I Wrote About Judith Curry. And he said that the general reaction from all these important people is that people shouldn't be listening to me. She's not important enough. Now, if I had been a male, they never would have said I wasn't important enough. But the bigger issue is it wasn't about me. It's what I had to say. And it's a message that needed to get out there. And I was the only one who was prepared to say these things. Um, you know, so so this is when my ostracism really started, I would say 2010. Um, and, you know, then I continued you know, doing what I do. I started my blog, Climate Etc. in 2010. Which to is still explore. Really strong. Yeah, it's still, yeah, um, it's still not as, science blogs aren't as popular as they were back in the day. 
but th there's still a lot of activity and, you know, it's very active blog still, but it doesn't have the big following that it used to be, used to have in the heyday. Um, but I started exploring many dimensions of this issues, including, you know, the politicization and the social psychology and all these things that were going on. And, you know, this further further cemented, you know, my <laughs> status as a denier within the climate community. But I de developed a broader network of people, of open-minded, educated thinkers from um, philosophy, social psychology, the legal field, economics, and, you know, politicians, decision, real decision makers, and on and on it goes. And these are the people that, you know, I'm, I'm engaging with it to this day, rather than the hardcore uh, climate science community. And, and this sort of, during this period, it, it set, okay, my company, Climate Forecast Applications Network, was started in 2006. And we, we started providing hurricane forecasts you know, extended lead times, sort of some innovative methods that we did. So so the hurricane issue, I really dug into it, you know, following the 2005 paper. Um, but within the company, yeah, you know, I was dealing with other businesses and decision makers, government decision makers. And, you know, I started looking at this whole thing from more of a risk perspective, OK, and I started digging deep into risk science and decision making uncertainty. And, and this really colored about, you know, how I develop the forecast products and interact with my clients and provide service to them. So this really put me along a very different path from what other climate scientists are going, you know, which and my thinking on this culminated in my new book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk, where I go through, you know, all of the, these issues. And, you know, towards the end of the book, I, you know, point us in a different direction. You know, what, what I see is the best way forward. So so that's sort of my journey. Hmm. And I, and eventually you, you left Georgia Tech because you were, but you weren't fired or uh, you, you decided no, to, no. to leave yourself. No, at Georgia Tech, I resigned my faculty position in January 2017. Um, I saw the writing on the wall. I mean, I was becoming, I was unpopular with the administration at Georgia Tech because they didn't like the negative, you know, their chairman being called a climate denier and stuff like that. I was unpopular with the administration. Um, so um, I was asked to step down from being chair. Well, I had been chair for a long time, so that was fine. But it was clear to me that I was going to be completely marginalized yeah. at Georgia Tech. So I started looking elsewhere for other positions. I wanted to move to the Western U.S. anyways. So I started, you know, headhunters were asking me to apply for jobs. And I, I even interviewed for several very high profile jobs. And the headhunter said, wow, you're a great candidate, but nobody's going to hire you because if you Google Judith Curry, what you get is Judith Curry climate denier, Judith Curry serial climate disinformer. You get all this junk <laughs> and, and, and no university administrators would hire you with that kind of a social media profile. Okay, so I now see the writing on the wall. Um, I was tenured, I could have hung around at Georgia Tech and, you know, sucked up my big salary, but that's not who I am. So I resigned my position. And now I'm full time in the private sector. Things are much more interesting, and certainly much more honest mm. in the private sector than they were in the university system. Well, you it's fascinating. I think you you made the right choice there. Uh you mentioned that you you were had these troubles partly because you you're a woman and, and that's probably true. I mean, you 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 have experienced that firsthand. But you know about uh, Roger Pilkey Jr., of course. I think he he's a former colleague of yours from Boulder. You were Yes, yes. You know, yeah. And and you yes. know about his I mean, his he's also been ostracized in right. this field. But, you know, He's younger, like he's in his 50s. Yeah. I mean, if, you know, if I had been younger, I don't know if I would have spoken out like I did. I knew I was taking a risk. If I had kids to put through college and a mortgage payment, 
you know, I said, oh, can I afford for something really bad to happen with my career? And I would have said no. But, you know, I was old enough, you know, I was late 50s, early 60s at the time. And I said, well, you know, if I have to retire from the university, I can manage financially and I can, you know, go full time to the company. Mm. So I had an out at the time, you know, by 2010, I knew I was skating on thin ice. Okay, that this was what I was doing was deeply unpopular. It was harming my career. But I, you know, so firmly thought that this was the right thing to do. And so I'm going to do what I think is right. I mean, that's, you know, I do have a little bit of personal and professional integrity. I'm not just going to play the game um, and do what it takes to succeed and stay out of trouble. That's just not who I am. Mm. So here I am, <laughs> you know, I'm in a pretty happy place. Um, so I made the right choices, but it was a while. The last, you know, the last 15 years have really been a wild ride. Wild ride and, and a tough ride. But yeah, I think you made the right decisions. And we are quite a few people who are happy that you have said the things and wrote, written the things that you have. We learned so much from that. And uh and I think it's fascinating. I mean, I've been interested in the climate issue since, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, since I was a kid, really. I was a weather nerd when I was a kid. So uh, I think it's really sad that it's been so, as you say, politicized and things like that. But there's another guy, actually, who did something interesting in this field just recently, another climate scientist, but he's very, he's a spe it's more specified. I think he's, uh, he's um, into studying wildfires and the connection with climate change. His, his name is Patrick Brown. I don't know if you're familiar with oh, that. Patrick Brown. Oh, absolutely. No, yeah. he's excellent. You know, yeah. Excellent. And he wrote this piece after having published <laughs> uh, a peer-reviewed paper in, in some, I think it was in Nature or some other some other scientific journal. Then he wrote this piece for, I don't know, was it the Breakthrough Institute or the, the Brownstone yeah, Institute? So, yeah. One of them. <laughs> breakthrough, yeah. Breakthrough, yeah. where he just uh, explained very open-heartedly, very open-heartedly and very honestly that we, well, we we uh, we, we wrote this uh, the abstract and we wrote the the headline and the and the main parts of this uh, paper just to appease the 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 editors of this scientific journal. And they they want the, they want this information to be to be you know. Uh, written in a way so that you can you can you can uh, highlight the impact of climate change. So and then then he explained that that actually really this was this wasn't even I mean a small wasn't even a tiny fraction of of the whole situation of the whole problem. And there are dozens of other factors that are more important than climate change to decide whether wildfire is going to be severe or not, or if it's going to happen at all. So this is this was kind of fascinating. But he also said something interesting in, in an interview I heard, which makes me realize, or may, should make anyone realize, that this is a very, it's a broad spectrum. People have all kinds of views. I mean, the, the scientific um, view on the climate issue and, and the personal view from people working in it can can differ and because he said in an interview that when he got the the question are you are you a climate denier do, do you think that do you think that that humans are contributing to this oh yes he said i think it's it's all of it i think humans are 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 um, responsible for 100% of the warming that we've seen i can't see any other explanation and i found found that almost unscientific isn't it people are lumped a couple i have a couple of points this is a great one to bring up, um, you know, people who are, he, he's an expert on climate in the sense he studies climate change impacts, heat waves. And, and his point is very similar to Roger Pilkey Jr. I mean, they both accept the 100%, the IPCC consensus on the causes of warming, but they're really focused on the impacts. Well, the warming is just not causing this stuff, you know, it's other factors. So Patrick Brown is really coming from the same place from Roger Pilkey Jr. So, so they're they're in okay. There's three categories of climate experts. You know, you know, one is the people like the El Gore types who just recite talking points. Okay, the other one is people like Roger Pilkey Jr. and Patrick Brown who can read the IPCC reports and understand what they say about climate dynamics. 
But there's a third category of people who have substantial expertise in climate dynamics and can critically evaluate what the IPCC is saying. So people like Richard Lindzen, you know, myself, you know, would be put in that category, people who can critically evaluate it. So Pilkey Jr. and Patrick Brown are in that second category. They're not speaking to the causes of climate change. They don't publish on that topic, but they're focused on the impacts of warming. And they very rightfully, you know, do not see you know, much of any um, impacts in terms of wildfires, hurricanes, and on it goes from global warming. Now, with regards to the journals, Nature and Science in particular, these are the two most prestigious scientific journals in the world. And they reject most of the papers that are submitted to them before even sending them out to review. So they're not interesting. They're not important. And so if you don't, if something has got to have a catchy title and it's got to play to the themes, you know, the global warming thing. I mean, in, the, the editor of back in, I'm trying to figure out when this was, and it might have been 2015, but the then editor of the journal Science, Marcia McNutt, wrote this editorial entitled Beyond the Two Degree inferno that the time for debate is over and this is the editor of the journal of science what kind of message does that give to people who are submitting papers to science not to mention the editors you know of the journal who are reviewing these papers you know if you have something skeptical to say about climate change don't bother to submit it to science yeah. and i think this is like the same point that Patrick Brown was making with this nature um, paper that, you know, they're just going to reject it out of hand. They're not even going to, they're going to send it back to you. They don't, won't even send it out for peer review. They'll just reject it. Yeah. And that, that's why it was so good that he wrote that piece. And it's very, I mean, for those who will read it, it, it won't be reviewed and referred to in, in most of the mainstream media, but uh, some people have found it at least and uh, and i think it's very very valuable that that some scientists speak up and i mean he's also young you, you mentioned that uh, okay now he's he he, younger than you but yeah okay he had a faculty position and he just left he saw the writing on the wall so yeah. he's working for breakthrough institute you know which is a think tank you know that's privately funded and this is a much safer place so if if you're a a scientist who is skeptical about all this university is a very hostile place. You want to be in the private sector or, you know, working for a think tank type place uh, or an advocacy organization. I mean, those are <laughs> the places to be. Yeah. Uh, not the universities. And that's a very sad state of affairs. It is. Yeah. Well, um, Pilkey is still working at a university as, as a professor, but Maybe he it, also sees tough. the writing on the wall. I don't know. Oh, no, it's tough. He's he's going to stick it out, but it's tough. Yeah. He's lost institute. He's you know has the tiny office, and he's he's pretty marginalized. But mm. you know he's sticking it out as well. Yeah. He should. Yeah, and, and he has actually, this Substack. Um, uh, right. What do you call it? The, yeah, well, a blog or something of of sorts. Yeah, and he's it's very he, popular, he, and he's he's. I think he's making some money off of that. So. Making some income. And mm. actually, University of Colorado is a little bit more open place mm. than many universities. Mm. So I, I, he's okay. Okay, so let's go into the, the climate details here. Now now it's uh, it's where it's going to become a little bit geeky, I think. <laughs> but I think it's important because this is actually what it's all about. Let, let me just try try on you here the, the tenets of the climate issue. There are several things to to separate in the climate debate that people are maybe not always aware of. So let me try to list the the, the base kind of basic questions that need to be addressed. So and and please correct me afterwards if you think I missed something or you wanna yeah uh, delete some some of them or one of them or or so. So one, how much CO two is in the atmosphere? How much of it is a human contribution. How much does extra CO2 warm the atmosphere? How much 
can the atmosphere warm regardless of extra CO2? What effects does warming have on the weather? Is warming detrimental and is it only detrimental or also beneficial? And finally, is warming even dangerous? And if so, at what level of warming does it become dangerous? So would you like to add or? Well, <laughs> well you certainly covered all the bases. I did. Um, you know, I think the IPCC writes about 5,000 <laughs> words or, or 5,000 pages on these topics every five years. But in a nutshell, okay, there's about, I mean, C carbon dioxide is a trace gas in the atmosphere. There's about 420 parts per million in terms of like the, the fraction of molecules. So it's a small fraction. But the reason it matters is because they have an infrared emission spectra. So, um, you know, unlike nitrogen, where the radiation just passes through, you know, and the nitrogen's there, but it doesn't influence the radiation balance. But CO2 has an emission spectra like water vapor and some other gases. So, so they matter, even though they're not there in very large concentrations. Um, there's a lot of natural factors that contribute carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Some of it's released from the ocean. <laughs> Certainly forest fires <laughs> end up emitting a lot of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, uh, volcanic eruptions. Um, so, so there's a, you know, a whole global, car you know, weathering of rocks and geologic processes on longer time scales. So there's a lot of factors um, involved in the global carbon cycle. Humans are emitting a fraction, not a very large fraction. Is it four percent of the total cycle that that we are responsible for? Yes, something like that. And about half of the um, CO two that's emitted into the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere at least for a while, and the other half is pretty quickly cycled into the ocean or plants or whatever. But the claim is, is that, you know, everything was in balance before humans started emitting CO2. So this increase in CO2 is caused by our emissions. Well, partly it is, but there's a whole cycle and feedbacks with temperatures. So it's not simple, but I don't question that overall, you know, uh, human emissions are the main cause. Increasing so. the, the level, the general level of CO2. Yeah, but I mean, which, that, one, which ones of these questions that I just raised here are not being debated or discussed in the okay, general? The, 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 the weakest part of the argument is whether warming is dangerous. Oh, yeah. Okay. First off, um, that's a value judgment about which scientist has little to say. I mean, some people find it's, you know, extinction catastrophic and other people say, well, no big deal. Um, you know, it's it's any dangers is a fraction of the benefits that we get from burning fossil fuels. So you have this insane spectrum, you know, of perspectives on whether it's dangerous or not. And it ties into your political leanings, your personal risk tolerance and on and on it goes. But, but looking at it objectively, you know, as a real like risk manager would look at, the biggest problem that the biggest mistake we've made is conflating this incremental slow creep of warming, incremental risk, slow increase of sea level rise, you know, melting of glaciers with the emergency risks from extreme weather events, you know, hurricanes, fires, floods, heat waves, and on and on it goes, which have little, if anything, to do with the warming. I mean, heat wave, okay, so if you have a big heat wave, like we had a big one a couple years ago in Oregon, where the temperatures reached 116 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I know you think in Celsius, I can't do a quick conversion to Celsius. Uh, that would be over, it, over four, more than 40, maybe 45, something like that. Yeah, something like that. It, it was very hot. And so, so the best study of attribution, you know, it was atmospheric circulation patterns, and the extra CO2 may have added two degrees Fahrenheit to that. So instead of 116 degrees, we would have gotten 114 degrees. It still would have been a horrible heat wave, and it might have been made a tiny bit worse by warming. 
But other things like floods and wildfires and, and all of these things, most of them have downward trends or in some regions, you know, so there's no overall increasing trend in any of these things. Um, well, so that's the conclusion by by Roger Pilkey, basically that that, uh, or I mean by the IPCC, really. If you read well, the IPCC, uh, method, which nobody does, but it's like heat waves are increasing or they're more common because it's it has gotten warmer, so that's common. why we have more warm days. But otherwise, you can't yeah, see many. They're trends. not more common. It's when a heat wave occurs, and that's tied to blocking events and atmospheric circulation patterns. When a heat wave occurs. It's going to be a little bit more intense because yeah. of the extra CO2. And we also have fewer cold days? Uh, in principle, that's what the IPCC says. We should have fewer cold waves, but it's not what we're really seeing. <laughs> you know, you know, we're seeing we're still, we're still setting, you know, to some extent, we're seeing fewer cold, cold extremes, but we're yeah. still seeing cold records being that's set. True. That's true. But yeah. they're not as so, common as I mean, I follow this. It's they're not as common yeah. as they yeah, the, 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 yeah. Anyway, that's that's a detail. In the U.S., in, in the in the Great Plains of the U.S., we we have seen a lot of record cold cold waves in recent years. You yeah. know, go figure in this warming environment. But so overall, fewer cold extremes and some additional heat extremes. Now, in terms of mortality, there's almost an order of magnitude more people dying from cold extremes and heat extremes. I mean, you never hear that. You said, oh, you know, the heat extremes are increasing mortality. Well, yeah, they are, but at a far less, <laughs> you know, it, it's we're benefiting far more from fewer cold extremes in terms of mortality. You know, cold extremes are far more deadly. I mean, you never hear that. <laughs> okay. So um I know that I, I know it, but I, I, you're right that <laughs> most people don't. I think it's a between eight and 17 times more people die from cold than from heat, depending on what study you're looking at. Well, there was a synthesis maybe published a year ago that found globally that it was a factor of nine, nine times more cold deaths than yeah, something heat like deaths that. Yeah. globally. But, but there's a range for different countries and whatever. But if you throw it all into the global hopper, you know, it's almost an order of magnitude. Yeah. You know, which is remarkable. We never hear that. And the other thing about, I mean, there are some winners. I mean, if you're in Canada or Siberia or northern China, I mean, warming has to look pretty attractive. I mean, you know, of course, length here in this country where I am. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, a little bit more warmth is not entirely undesirable. Mm -hmm. Um in the globe, you know, in certain regions, you know, like Dubai has told you know things get very very hot in Dubai, but they have engineered their land, their infrastructure, and chain you know everything. So they're totally protected from the heat, and all the sports events and the the outside construction that all happens at night. Okay, <laughs> so you know that's adaptation. So if you have enough money, you can totally adapt to the heat, but you know people yeah. just. It reminds me of what, what the Netherlands uh, has done with, uh, I mean, living mostly below the, below sea level since I know, it's hundreds of years ago. And they, they managed that excellently. It's remarkable. Yeah. I mean, some parts of the Netherlands are seven. Seven meters, meters, I think, below. Seven meters below sea level. I mean, that's insane. And they manage this. That they they spend a lot of money, um, but you know, they're also rich them. at the same time. So I mean, some but they must have done something right. <laughs> well, the, well, the, the, they're okay. Now the, this is a concern. You know, I talk about all this nonsense leading to bad policy. Um, the Netherlands is the breadbasket, and they provide a lot of the food for Europe. I mean, but this tiny country, yeah. second oh, biggest yeah. exporter of foods in the world, I think, after I the know. US. tiny country. They've engineered, you know, every inch of their land growing and greenhouses and whatever and, and livestock and what. And, and now they're, you know, saying they want to kill off large fractions of their livestock because they're worried about the methane emissions. They're trying to restrict the fertilizer that the farmers can use. And, you know, they're, they're killing off the food supply for Europe. I mean, what kind of sense does this make? Makes absolutely no sense. There may be, I mean, 
the Dutch are really smart about all this. There are maybe ways that they can improve things to reduce CO2 emissions, but they're already doing such a fabulous job. You know, I'm assuming they're, you know, doing things right. And if there are ways to improve, they're, they'll do it, you know, but don't cut them off at the knees you know, and, and impair their food production because Europe is surely going to suffer if they do. Yeah. And so this makes sense. I, I agree. Uh, since we're speaking of how dangerous things are because of, of uh, warming, I have a couple of questions around that. I mean, we already talked about the the frequency of extreme events, which uh, is not actually increasing very much apart from heat waves, as, as we just said. But an interesting thing here is, which is actually not very much spoken about, maybe it's because it's, uh, anyway, you, you will have to assess this <laughs> yourself. I mean, Climate policy, po climate policy has come to hinge almost entirely on these, you know, uh, thresholds: one point five degrees Celsius and two two degrees Celsius, and they're described as apocalyptic abysses almost. Uh, but the world seems to, especially this year, I'm, I'm going to come back to this year uh, later. <laughs> but the world seems to be pretty close to one point five degrees. I mean, as a whole, and I know that Europe. As far as uh, I can, I can tell from reading Copernicus Climate uh, Service has experienced has already experienced over two degrees warming for several years now. But I mean, has Europe perished? It hasn't, has it? Okay. First off, a lot of Europe's heating is associated with the urban heat island effect. Okay, and I had I, I looked at this specifically for the Netherlands for a project I was working on, and you know sometimes there's ten ten degrees difference between a city and the surrounding rural areas. I mean, so so the urban heat, you know, the more so, so the urban heat island effect is a big deal in Europe, and it's only increasing with time. Okay, a lot of and this is exacerbating heat waves in urban centers. Okay, the the uh, okay, that's an aside. But these targets are purely political. Okay, back in 1992, the UN Framework Convention Climate Change Treaty, um, 1992, signed by 196 countries, including the U.S., to eliminate fossil fuels to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate. This is back in 1992 before we had any idea what was going on and the temperatures weren't even increasing very much back then. But we had this international treaty. So from the very beginning, the policy cart has been out there in front of the scientific horse. <laughs> One of the things that, you know, through all this IPCC, I mean, they never really defined what dangerous is. Okay, and it wasn't until about 2010, 2015, that they decided on the two degrees centigrade target. I mean, the, science, the IPC scientists were not involved in this. It was purely a political decision. And this was designed to provide maximum pressure, you know, on the countries to eliminate fossil fuels. And then back in 2018, the IPCC was asked to do a special report on 1.5 degrees. So they figured that maybe two degrees look like maybe, well, maybe we can stay within two degrees. We need to amp up the pressure. <laughs> so they went with this 1.5 degrees. So all of this is designed to maximize the pressure on countries to reduce fossil fuel emissions. So these targets are pretty meaningless. I mean, it's possible that will exceed 1.5 degrees centigrade this year. But 1.5 degrees centigrade relative to what? The baseline for all this is the second half of the 19th century, okay? And this is just after we ex exited or started. 
Up the, the little ice age, okay, the little ice age, you know, from the 1300s to the mid 19th century was a horrible period, especially in Europe, there were famines and Europeans were drowning witches blaming bad weather for them. I mean, it was a very, very bad time. So why anybody thinks that the pre industrial climate was some kind of nirvana, I don't know. But, <laughs> in, you yeah. know, the reference for this warming you know, it's just right at, at the end of that period. So, I mean, a, a saner reference period would be the mid 20th century. I mean, rather than, you know, when the fossil fuel emissions started to take off and the temperatures was fairly flat, I mean, that would be a much more sensible reference period. But it sounds much scarier, you yeah. know, that we've earned two degrees centigrade but, I agree, you know, and I, I've also always thought it was it, it's a strange way of uh, it's a strange um, benchmark because I mean we don't know nobody knows <laughs> it, it. I mean, talking about control knobs, if we can we we can't control the level of CO two as much as we think we can, and I mean it's even well, more CO two more it's difficult to control the temperature itself because there are so many factors yeah. going on. so anyway yeah yeah the natural climate variability in my opinion is really you know the the dominant factor um we're i mean it would be saying it with a, with the co2 uh, target then wouldn't it yeah i mean when we if when and if we meet the 2 degrees centigrade target will largely be determined by natural climate variability it'll be slowed down if there's some big volcanic eruptions like, you know, we in, in the early 1900s, there were three explosive volcanic eruptions, including Tambora, the so-called, you know, following that the year without a summer, you know, <laughs> huge. And, and the last 150 years have been very quiet in terms of volcanoes. Well, we could see that kind of high level of activity again, which would really slow down, which, which would produce cooling, not to mention slow down the warming, yeah. uh, the ocean circulation patterns, multi-decadal to millennial scale patterns, which redistribute heat, um, you know, are a huge factor. And they're the dominant factor in dis determining decadal scale variability of extreme weather events. And then we have solar variations. I mean, the, the last half of the 20th century was a grand solar maximum, you know, the strongest solar activity that we had seen in a thousand years. And, you know, we're headed downwards from that, um, whether we'll see a, a substantial minimum in the 20th century, we don't know, but some people think we do. But the indirect solar effects are largely underappreciated, poorly understood, and certainly not included in climate models. So there's a lot of stuff that could happen with natural climate var variability, which could change this narrative. And <clears throat> I don't know if you're ready to jump into the current year, but a lot of what's going on with the crazy temperature spike the last six months is yeah. natural variability. Nothing yeah. to do with- yeah, I was gonna, Yes, I'm, I'm gonna get back to that. So. Uh... Hold your horses a little bit, but I'm just going to say that you said that that Europe, the, the temperature increase in Europe is largely due to the urban heat island effect, and I mean that's also very notable in in India and China and and also the United States, I guess. But maybe it's it's bigger in in Europe. But anyway, I, I was going to say that there are some interesting regional differences here in the, in the heat in the in the warming, and it's not just Arctic versus the rest because yeah. if you compare, for instance, Europe with Eastern the United States, Eastern United States, which is interesting. You, you're familiar with the, the so-called U.S. warming hole, <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, which, yeah, yeah. which means that the eastern half of the United States has actually almost not warmed at all since the 1950s, whereas Western Europe has warmed 2.2 degrees or something like that. I mean, uh, above the pre-industrial level. So, what do you make of that? There's something um, going on there. <laughs> again, there's a, the this warming. I mean, there are not, urban heat island effects in the eastern U.S. as well. Sorry, I just wanted okay, to. But there, there's climate scientists are starting to wake up to it. They call it the pattern effect. Okay, that that the warming is inhomogeneous. You know, and and a lot of this. Okay, sure, it can be driven by urban heat island effects and local like pollution, particle pollution, like. 
people for a long time thought that the, the Southeast U.S. was cooling hole was associated with coal burning. Um, and certainly maybe part of it was, but they don't do so much coal burning in the Southeast U.S. anymore. It's still a cooling hole. Um, a, a part of it is uh, ocean circulation patterns, which set up certain atmospheric patterns, which determine, you know, which place is relatively cool and which place is relatively warm. So, I mean, that's mostly what's going on. It, it's circulation patterns yeah. distribute heat. Is it called the cooling hole or the warming hole? Because I, I read it's it's the illogical warming. that it should be called the, the warming hole, but I read that it actually was called that. <laughs> I, who knows? It's a hole in the warming. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. You can't talk about cooling on the subject. And, you know, that would... <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> that's true okay let's dive into the the what's happening right now and also a little bit about the the, the this um, climate sensitivity thing because you have i mean this is technical but it's 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 an important matter because one of this one of the basic tenets of the the whole climate uh, discussion is how much i mean how sensitive is the climate to an increase of the co2 level in the atmosphere and um the IPCC has come to the conclusion. I mean, it was almost for for 40 years, it was between 1.5 and 4.5 degrees Celsius. That was the span in between within which uh, there was a discussion that oh, the climate sensitivity is probably this big. And it's, uh, it is uh, how much it's going to warm uh, with a doubling of the CO2 levels from pre-industrial levels. And those were, I think you mentioned it, 280 parts per million before everything started and a doubling means then 560 and we're now in somewhere in the middle i think it's 420 ppm right now so yeah. now and then i think in the latest report the ipcc actually tightened this this the span so it's now from 2.5 to 4 so maximum 4 and minimum 2.5 and, and best guess is 3 degrees uh, with a doubling but you you think that that is too high because you've made your own calculations about around this, right? Okay. All right. Uh, just a little bit of historical, you know, the 1.5 to 4.5. Let's go back to the IPCC AR5. They had one, the likely range was 1.5 to 4.5 degrees. Okay, this is 66% probability that it's in this range. For the larger range, for the 90% probability range, it was between one degree and six degrees. A factor of six. Uncertainty. I mean, this is huge. Now, the IPCC six assessment um, narrowed this. Okay, so what did they do? First off, they they threw out the climate models. The climate models were running too hot. I mean, in the IPCC fourth assessment, they totally relied on climate models. The fifth assessment, they relied on climate models and observations and noted that the climate models were on the high end, the observations were on the low end, and they declined to give a median range, you know, because, you know, the median may not be so meaningful when you have two peaks like that. The IPCC six assessment report, they threw out the climate models and only looked at observations from both um, the historical observations and paleoclimate observations and also process models. So there was an influential paper, you know, about you know, the IPC, you know, all the people publishing in this under the World Meteorological Organization, they all got together and came up with this paper that was published a year before the IPCC report by Sherwood et al. And they combined all this and they came up with the essentially the, the 2.5 to 4 degrees. Um, they threw out the high end values based on paleoclimate evidence. And I think that was appropriate. But they also threw out the lower end values, um, which I don't think was appropriate. <clears throat> My colleague, Nick Lewis. Now, yeah, he wrote on your blog. I, I saw. Right, I saw. right, right. OK, my colleague, Nick Lewis, he's up. He's not a climate scientist. He's a semi-retired financier in the UK who really knows a lot about statistics. And a little over 10 years ago, um, he started you know, he was motivated by the climate auditing movement started by Steve McIntyre, 
but he wanted to look at a different issue, so he picked climate sensitivity. So he started doing a deep dive into the climate sensitivity issue and brought better statistical analyses to the table. And I co-authored a few papers with him on this subject, and he's coming up with values that are lower, you know, with that are centered more between like 1.6 and 2 degrees centigrade. And his most recent paper um, did a critique of the Sherwood et al. paper and showed how, you know, I found a couple of errors, <clears throat> but basically used some more recent parameters from the paleoclimate literature and, and whatnot, and redid the analysis and came up with something like between 1.8 and 2.9 degrees, you know, was the likely, you know, was the range. And this is basically using generally the same strategy that Sherwood et al. did, but using updated parameters, some better statistical methods, and fixing some mistakes. <laughs> okay. So, wow. I mean, that's a big difference. Um, and he found that the average value is, I think, 2.0. 2.15 degrees for sensitivity. And that's even below the likely range from the IPCC and the Sherwood. So I think we need to go back to the IPCC AR5, you know, between 1.5 and 4.5, um, with the bottom range going to one. But I think it is pretty hard to justify anything beyond four degrees or 4.5. So keeping that, I think we've got a better handle on the upper bound than we do on the lower bound. But if you step back, all of these methods do not adequately um, include the impacts of the large scale ocean oscillations in terms of how this could be fooling us both in the paleoclimate and the historical climate re record. Nick Lewis has tried to account for that and he accounts for part of it, but the other ones aren't cognizant. So it could be significantly lower. I mean, on the lower end. Personally, I think it's in, on the lower end. Sorry, say 1.5 to 2.5, maybe up to so, 3. You know, 1.5 so, to 3. Okay, so 1.5 to 3. So say, say the climate sensitivity is, is 1.5 degrees, uh, doubling of CO2 from pre-industrial times uh, will increase the temperature with by, say, 1.5 degrees Celsius centigrade. And in comes 2023 and shatters all previous temperature records. And we, we will already be at 1.5, probably by the end of this year. So you were already touching on this before. So what is going on here? Okay. Since, two, you know, there's a lot of things that go into determining surface temperature. I mean, the radiation aspects, you know, the... Sun's radiation and the um, infrared radiation from the Earth and the atmosphere are a factor, but there's also um, things that go on at the surface, ocean, evaporation, heat budget, heat balance, things like that. So um, I did a blog, you know, when I, we first saw this coming, you know, we, we, had, we had a hard time predicting the seasonal hurricanes forecast this year because of the crazy situation in the Atlantic and an El Nino that wasn't behaving as it was supposed to be. So I was, you know, really looking at the Atlantic, you know, and I saw, okay, the, the ocean temperatures are off the chart. What's going on? So I looked at the top of the atmosphere radiation measurements and to see what's going on. And since 2015, the Earth's surface and the you know the Earth's atmosphere has been absorbing more sunlight. Okay, so what's going on? Well, this is mostly associated with changes in the clouds. You know, the overall cloudiness is decreasing, and this is letting more sunlight in. Uh, we've also re you know cleaning up some of the pollution particulates which reflect solar radiation back up. So if you get rid of those, more solar radiation is coming in. So a combination of less pollution aerosol and more clouds is letting more solar radiation in. In terms of the infrared, where you'd expect to see a CO2 signal 
you know, increasing. It was actually decreasing a bit, which is a signal of the reduced cloudy, you know, in infrared emissions from clouds. So this is totally this warming. Most of the warming since 2015 seems to be more driven by what's going on with the solar radiation part of the budget. So, so just looking at this um, summer, we're, we're on the ascending path of the solar cycle, the 11 year solar cycle, and we had a, a flare up. So like a little bit of that is just directly from the sun. A big part of it is related to um, reduced cloudiness in the Northern hemisphere main shipping lanes. We're seeing a reduction associated with a change in the shipping fuel to admit fewer sulfate particles. And you can see that, you know, in the Northern hemisphere, mid-latitude shipping line. And then the other factor is the Hunga Tonga eruption a few years ago. Now this was an unusual volcanic eruption. You know, I think it was in January last year. I, I, it's been like a year and a half. Yeah, a year and a half. Okay, so this was an underwater volcano that when it erupted, it, it spewed some sulfate particles. That's what you normally expect from volcanoes, which have a cooling effect, but it spewed enormous amount of water vapor that made it into the stratosphere. So the stratosphere is like, you know, 10 miles kind of thing, you know, above, above the Earth's surface. And so once the water vapor is up there, it hangs around for a while. It doesn't rain out. You know, it's not caught up in the lower atmosphere processes. And so this is circulating you know, all over the globe. Okay, it's having a big impact this past summer, which is the Southern Hemisphere winter on what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it's producing an early and strong ozone hole. It's associated with strange circulation patterns, which are pushing strong winds from the north to the south, which are compacting the sea ice, which has contributed to a very low sea ice season in the Antarctic. But they're getting a lot of snow on Antarctica, you know, which is adding to the ice mass. So this is a very unusual thing. Um, now, as this water vapor in the stratosphere makes it into the northern hemisphere. I, you know, we can probably expect some weird things from Hunga Tonga um, in the northern hemisphere this winter. Also, um, in terms of the overall temperature effect from Hunga Tonga on global temperature, you have a little bit of compensation from the solar reflection from the sulfate aerosol particles and the infrared warming from the um, water vapor. I think, you know, the jury's still out on how that is playing out regionally and globally, but the biggest impacts are in the winter hemisphere, you know, where the sun effect is eliminate, you know, is reduced and you're getting more of this um, infrared warming effect from Hunga Tonga. So you've got lots of weird things going on yeah. and the CO2 increase is lost in the noise here. <laughs> this warming has I mean, nothing is it, to do. Is it, is it, I mean, can you at all attribute any any of this this temperature spike that we've seen this year to CO2 increase? Um, uh, you know, for a six-month increase of CO2 is, you know, you know minuscule. Um, but, you know, the actual... But it's going to be explained of, as that in, in the mainstream media. The top you know. of atmosphere, long wave, outgoing long wave should be increasing. If it's everything is driven by CO2, it's actually decreasing because of the impact of reduced cloudiness. <laughs> you know, so any effect that the, the effect from CO2 increases there, but it's swamped out by everything else that's going on. That's fascinating. I mean, this is I, I, this is so interesting, and it's I, I know what it's going to say in the headlines about these temperature spikes, but I, I actually saw the. In the Copernicus latest uh, summary of October, they they actually had a, a, a brief discussion about the El Nino, which they said was probably a factor. But they also admitted that it wasn't as strong as it's nor it normally should be at this oh, time. Uh, I mean, and despite so, I mean, that's also a thing. It's it's the El Nino hadn't hadn't even 
started when this temperature spike happened, had it? No, the, the El Nino. Okay, if we we've had this, it started in June, July. The well, spike. The I mean, and then you know, so, yeah. so the El Nino is you know the magnitude of the El Nino is referenced more to climatological temperatures. So it's over exaggerated by just looking at the temperature records. So it's. It's it's a relatively moderate El Nino, and it hasn't really coupled with the atmosphere yet. It's just starting to do that now. You know, literally, I think in the last week we've had a big ocean Kelvin wave and a westerly wind burst, which is going to give a boost and couple it better to the atmosphere, because a lot of things that you expect to see in the atmosphere during an El Nino year just have not been happening. There's some signs right now that it may be start to look like more of a real El Nino, but it hasn't been. So it's been a relatively minor factor in this heat spike. Yeah. This thing you say about this finding that, that cloudiness has been reduced, uh, I, I read in some study uh, some time ago that this is actually has actually been the case, at least over Europe, for a couple of decades, or, or maybe three decades, or so, that cloudiness has has what has been lower uh, uh, it than it be used to be, which means yeah. that I mean, much of the the increase, the temperature increase, uh, even I mean, even uh, many years back, could be because of this. Do, what do you say about that? Uh, well, it could be. I mean, you see, I see the global trend starting in 2015. Okay, yeah, maybe I can uh, find, if I can find that study, I can, I can mail it to yeah, you. There could be, there could very well be regional trends, but a lot of this is dominated by circulation patterns in the ocean and the atmosphere. That's what determine what the clouds are doing. Yeah. Um, I also, I also saw that James Hansen. I mean, who he was the most one of the most prominent scientists on the quote unquote alarmist in the alarmist camp. Uh, he seems to agree on you with it, um, on this with you on this because he wrote okay, a paper he where it. he's where he said that this is what's happening now which I thought was was uh, very interesting he he actually wrote that what's happening this year cannot be co2 because there's something else going on and he was writing uh, about this reduced cloudiness and he was also writing about the the reduced uh, amount of uh, aerosols from uh, from from shipping and things like that so i mean you you seem to agree on that Close. We were close. He, he he assumed that the sulfate aerosol was changing the particle size of the clouds, which it was, but that's a relatively small effect relative to more or fewer clouds, which I think is the bigger issue. So it's not just the particle size, it's really the amount of cloudiness. Okay. So, um, but yeah, we both had the, you know, the, the same story generally on that one. It's not CO2. Um, it's really coming from the solar radiation part of the budget and it's associated with clouds. Now, you also mentioned the mysteriously high temperatures in the seas. I mean, already last spring before any El Nino had started. Do you started think that there is, yeah? In May. Mid May. It started in mid May. Okay, mid May. So, what what do you think that there is a possibility that the, the oceans are heated from below? I mean, after all, we are on a big planet which is very hot inside, and I mean, anything is possible. I don't. I don't know. Have you have you pondered this? I mean, yes, I have, um, and I pay more attention to that than most people do. Most people completely dismiss it. Oh, it's a steady heat flux at the bottom of a lot about two. But if there's, you know, underwater volcanic or okay, there was okay a year so ago. Some people th say also that there are a lot of volcanoes underneath Antarctica, and that's why the the ice is melting. Oh, gosh, yeah, that, that's a as huge an aside. issue. That, that to me, that is the dominant issue in any concern about the West Antarctic ice sheet. You know, it's an unstable ice sheet. The, the surface temperatures are cooling, you know, so don't blame it on warming. And they say, oh, well, the rising sea will melt it from below. Well, maybe, but not nearly as fast as under ice volcanoes are going to warm it from below. Um, you know, this is the issue, um, not global warming, you know, with the stability of the West Antarctic ice sheet. But that's talked about as the big, you know, global warming tipping point, you know, that we have to reduce warming so we don't. <laughs> collapse a West Antarctic ice sheet. <laughs> you know, we could stop burning fossil fuels right now. Um, and you yeah, know. talk talk more about the uh, the heat below underneath the the seas. 
there, there's like a you know almost 200 active volcanoes below or, or volcanoes only a few of which are active but even inactive ones give a heat flux so it's a very and in the oceans off the coast i mean there's underwater it's a very volcanically very active you know and thinking that you know it's atmospheric co2 is the driver for what's going on with the west antarctic ice sheet is you know is rather a joke um but this is getting more attention rightfully so um but yeah the issue you know i looked at this there was okay in the atlantic i pay a whole lot of attention to what exactly what's going on in the atlantic during hurricane season and so a year, you know, last year in 2022, there was this huge hot spot, you know, in, in the North Atlantic, sort of off the northeast coast of the U.S., you know, just looking at that. And then somebody start, you know, was talking about, oh, you know, an underwater volcanic eruption in that region. I go, what? <laughs> what? You know, why? Why aren't people talking about this in terms of the, you know, the crazy warm sea surface temperatures so you know i don't know how to reconcile the data of um underwater volcanic activity and local marine heat waves and stuff like that a lot of it's just ocean circulation but i think some of these marine heat waves have to be you know some forcing contributed by underwater volcanoes you know am i researching that topic no but th there's enough anecdotal evidence to make me you know really wonder about this you know why aren't we considering this and why aren't people looking at this in the context of the climate issue but the reason is because they really like this narrow framing everything is co2 you know that way <laughs> you know it you know people's careers and professional reputation and money and policy and everything all depends on this. So, yeah, you know, sad. people say, oh, okay, well, it was under ocean volcanoes. After all, we can stop worrying about CO2. <laughs> That's going to upset a lot of people, a lot of yeah. apple carts. I've heard some some people, some scientists in, in the field, maybe some would call them fringe scientists. I would just call them interesting scientists. They, they claim that that it all starts in the ocean and the ocean uh, warms the atmosphere and then then the third factor is increased co2 so it's, it's actually reversed it's the other way around it starts maybe it even starts beneath beneath the seas in the the deeper parts of the planet and then the seas are warmed well, and I, then I, the I atmosphere totally... is warmed and then you have co2 okay i i totally agree that the the, the big climate drivers are the sun and the oceans, <laughs> you know, the atmospheric compositions, a little bit of a minor side show, in my opinion. So. Fascinating. What's your take on the fact that, well, this is connected to what we just said here, that in geological times, long, long time ago, uh, increases in carbon dioxide came after increases in temperature. And I mean, this is not controversial because this is known and it's, you can see it in, in many papers and it's i think it might be in the ipcc report as well there was a study published recently that came to the conclusion that that this is what is going on today as well in the natural carbon cycle which is as we said around 95 or 96 percent of all the carbon in the atmosphere atmosphere so i mean that's that's fascinating so this is yeah i, I saw that paper too I, I mean i think that there's a lot of uncertainties in the global carbon cycle um, you know, we generally understand what the factors are and the directions of how things work. But in terms of a quantitative understanding of all this, <laughs> I don't think we have a very good understanding. So I would not be surprised if, you know, 20 years from now, we have a different view of how of what exactly is going on. But, you know, the party line is at 100 percent of the atmospheric increase in CO2 is caused by fossil fuel emissions. Um, no. I think that's it's, probably not the case. It's it's a big ship to turn around, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, you know, but but th this is the issue. I mean, climate science is is a very young field 
and it's being polluted by all this nonsense. So there's a whole lot of stuff that we don't understand. And I just wish we could, you know, get back to regular scientific business and try to figure this out rather than, you know, the scientists becoming activists and working to cancel people who disagree with them. You know, it's it's just a horrible situation. There's there's so many fascinating things that we don't understand, you know, that are just ripe for, you know, fascinating scientific research. And, and you know, we're not doing it because we're working inside this little narrow CO2 box, you know, that's driven by reducing fossil fuels. So So we're in a bad place with the science, but we need to, just decouple our policy, you know, you know, look, you know, our energy systems and our food systems, you know, we need to decouple all that from fossil fueled climate change issue. Yes, let, let's look forward in the 21st century and have better, you know, energy infrastructure and allowing for more abundant and cleaner and cheaper fuel. I mean, let's do that. I mean, wind and solar is taking us a step backwards. And with regards to our food supply, you know, let's imagine, you know, figure out better ways of making this in harmony, you know, with, with the earth and replenishing our soils and all this kind of thing. We, we can do better, no question about that. But having all this driven by um, concern or thinking that we can control the climate by eliminating fossil fuels very quickly. I mean, by 2100, we're probably not going to be burning fossil fuels. We'll still be using them for materials and niche applications. But how we get from here to there, I mean, we can do it stupidly by wasting a lot of money and screwing up our land with wind and solar farms and transmission lines everywhere and still have unreliable electricity and not be able to... <clears throat> expand the amount of electricity we want to use for all, you know, artificial intelligence and blockchain and and robotics, this, you know, for all the things that we want to do, we're going to be hampered by not enough electricity. So we can be smart about it, about it. I mean, the reason we're rushing to wind and solar, oh, because we have it right now, we can do it quickly. Yeah, you can do it quickly, but you can't bring it into the transmission grid. And you're going to have to replace you know, everything in 10 years, it's going to be crazy expensive and it's going to be intermittent. And there's no way that we have an, enough land, particularly in Europe and places that are densely populated, you know, to support all these wind farms and solar farms. Mm -hmm. And offshore, it's just totally, you know, an e a financial, an economic and ecological disaster. We just need to abandon that one. So, so once you get rid of the urgency, then, you know, well, nuclear becomes an obvious answer. And there's some very cool geothermal stuff that people, you know, advanced geothermal and things like that. Who knows what people can come up with, but we should be, I mean, working towards nuclear and geothermal and advancing, you know, other technologies that are maybe just on the drawing board at this stage. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what, you know, by 2100, if we go that route, uh, we're going to be in a much better place than if we're stuck with wind and solar and massive landfills and not enough electricity, you know, when we need it during extreme heat and cold events. I mean, we're going to be in a bad place. <laughs> so, you know, we, we need to turn this ship. Yeah. You know, do. and I think it's going to be something different. I think it's going to be something different altogether. Uh, free energy. I mean, energy is everywhere. It's out there. It's just, you just need to harness it in a smart way, as you say, and I could be by way of nuclear and geothermal and all that. But I, I think, I think there are actually even better things out there. There uh, could be. There that we could would be. See. And that would be wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That will so be wonderful. Should... One day, maybe I'm not here and you're not here, but some, some people will be here to enjoy. The 21st century to develop and explore these ideas and develop a learning curve and, you know, have all these different experiences and see what works in different locations, given their, their weather, their natural resources, their political and social preferences, you know, let's just get on with it and stop trying to, you know, tie one and a half hands behind our back by, you know, enforcing this wind and solar silliness on everybody.
I agree. Judith Curry, it's been a pleasure and an education to talk to you today. Uh, so where can people find out more about you and your work? Okay. Well, first off, my new book is Climate Uncertainty and Risk. You can buy it on Amazon. It's been, it's been translated into German. I think it's being in, translated into French. Um, so first, you know, check that out. Um, my blog is Climate Etc. JudithCurry.com. If you're on Twitter, you can follow me at Curry J A, and also my company, Climate Forecast Applications Network, CFANClimate.net. Okay, so we'll put the links in the dis description box, of course. So, <laughs> yeah. excellent. So, thank you so much, and good luck on the scientific barricades out there. Okay, thank you. I enjoyed talking with you.